Um, we'll do a few questions and then we'll do Q&A. So start thinking of um, gorgeous, scintillating questions. So when I looked at this book, I thought, oh my God, it was like a complete light bulb moment. I thought this book is so important and life-changing. And I know that sounds insane because it's essentially a fashion book, but it seemed to me like it was just like, forget about the secret. This book was so major and so important. And uh, for a very specific reason, I think a lot of people now, um, the media has got them very confused about what fashion is. And a lot of people across the board think that fashion is what celebrities wear. You know, it's gowns, or, or they just have some very unnuanced view of what fashion is. And your book, um, does this incredible mitzvah to the world like it says this is what fashion is supposed to be It's supposed to be this idiosyncratic world full of these crafty people full of these visionaries full of these gypsies and dyers and and you know idiosyncratic eccentric people who are truly creatively dri driven so this book says that fashion is nuance. So I'm very passionate about your book. So was that your intention or did it just come out like that? Well, no, definitely. I think that, you know, I think so much so much perception about fashion is about marketing and about, like you're saying, celebrity culture and street fashion and all these kind of things that, that I felt like it's so much more. And I think that there's so, like, just through my years of being kind of around it, that there's so many people that are working in it and doing so many creative things that people don't know about and aren't, they're not really, they're, they're the ones who should be cherished and should be brought up and and respected you know people who are working from a real passionate place and have a have a vision so that's that was really my goal groovy well it worked anyway Thanks. so <laughs> second question um now something awful must have happened when you were working on this book you must have been bitten by a dog or hit by a car or i'm always interested in when something goes horribly wrong so something vile must have happened when you're working on this book right don't you want to know that yeah. <laughs> See? Well, you know, I've been in a lot of people's homes and I've done a lot of photo shoots and work, you know, my book, my home book. And for instance, I photographed you and your place. <laughs> and just last week, I had an interviewer ask me about you and ask me about how many feather boas are in your closet. <laughs> and I refused to answer. So, you know, I just don't, I know it would be so much fun for everyone, but I just don't dish Listen, the dirt. Jimi Hendrix wore a feather boa. It takes a man to wear a feather boa, yeah. right? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, so you won't tell us about the time something really excruciatingly no. embarrassing happened when you were in Karl Lagerfeld's <laughs> living room and... Well, you know, with over his favorite Dunant sculpture. Car well, Carl, it was actually quite a funny, quite, quite a funny day. That that was for my first book, and when I photographed Carl, I got there early, and he was running a little bit late. So they're like, okay, you know, go go ahead, take some pictures of the space, and he'll be along, and you'll do his portrait. And so I'm okay, great. So I started taking pictures, and his assistant was watching me, and she's a very austere lady, and she dresses just like Carl, you know, with the high neck and the jewelry and everything. And I'm shooting, and she goes, don't take a picture of that. And I'm like, because I was taking a picture of all his iPods, you know? And I can't take a picture of that. And I was like, oh my God, oh. And she's like, no, I'm kidding. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so I, they have fun with that. So yeah, there's, there's have been some moments. Um, who else stands out from this book? What was Dries like, Dries Van Noten? Yeah, he's he he's um, very sweet. He seemed he's like obsessed with his garden. So that was like something that we talked about a lot. And he brought it, he every day he brings in flowers from his garden. He cuts them and he has like a whole ritual and then he like puts them around this the building and his he, garden I think is in the new Architectural Digest, isn't it? Yes. I haven't seen it pictures yeah. of it yet. Amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. And um, so I actually asked him about that in the interview about to design a garden. He draws this little funny thing. But yeah, he's. His, like I was saying, his workflow, it's, it was really interesting just to see his, I mean, he's got a whole warehouse there of just those incredible fabrics that he's done. It would be like any designer's dream to get to go in there. Um, next question. Hmm. So a lot of, a lot of what you're, you love and what I love is like, 
it's not just what the stuff is, it's how it's made, mm -hmm. the process. There's nothing more fun and interesting than going to a factory, right, and seeing, or you've got this girl, one of my favorites in your book is this chick that raises Angora rabbits and then shears them herself and knits the wool. It's really genius. Mm -hmm. But did you pick up any crafting tips? Are you now Mr. Crafty? Are you a crafty artisan? No. <laughs> it's. I mean, I have no. It was that was. I mean, it was amazing to see her with the bunnies and, you know, the giant angoras that were like this big. And she's like, and I was just loving them. And she, at one point, she's like, she was saw my enthusiasm. She's like, you should take one. <laughs> you should take one. I'm like, oh my god, I can't would want one, but they're just these giant fluff, and they just the shedding is like a. It's you just look and you see it just in the air, just you know. I'm like, Allergies. you know what? No, I'm no, I can't really do it, but yeah. There's a lot of temptation always to like take back the angora bunny or <laughs> you know whatever that, the aspect that could have is. Been that the title of your book, take back the angora bunny. <laughs> yes, this Todd Selby story. Um, all right, so. So people think that fashion people are very highly strung and neurotic and um, did any of the people have any hissy fits? You know what it's interesting is that my second book was so much more difficult to do than the fashion book. The food book was incredible. It was like you know, a hundred times more difficult because chefs are people that don't like to answer emails. They don't know who I am. They don't look at a blog. They're just like, what is this guy? Like, I got to just focus on my thing, you know? And they just, it was so challenging to try to be like, no, I'm the guy. And it was just about that. I was like, had to meet their friend. And then they had to know me. And oh, you know, Ignacio knows you. And, you know, it was like so much more about, and fashion, a lot, people are savvy. And they know who I am a lot of times or I could send them my book and they understand what I'm doing and it was it was much more straightforward really I also think the weird dirty secret about fashion is that people think oh fashion people are very arch they're very bitchy they're very you know and the weird thing is fashion people are actually incredibly sweet and supportive of one another to a degree that's almost annoying you want them to you want some of them to be evil and bitchy but very they just aren't there anymore don't you agree yeah I mean I, I didn't really experience it it was been very everyone's been very supportive and it was quite simple really um, so is there anybody you were dying to include in this book who eluded you there was um, <laughs> I really wanted to have a 90s supermodel and I wanted Naomi and I was like I knew it would be hard and I kept trying and it kept kind of coming around and maybe and then this and then we have a date and then it would flow go away and then it was this and I was like the elusive thing and I'm like okay well maybe if I spent another year trying to do it we could have if we delayed the book another year maybe I could have got her but you know it was always like I was like oh we got to have the diva 90s supermodel oh, moment I'm a you big know Naomi fan but what was it you were wanted why why were you drawn to Naomi why not Linda or Amber or I just felt like she was like the ultimate 90s diva supermodel like she's the one for me I was like that you know so maybe next time when she sees this book yeah. she's gonna kick herself that she didn't do it we can do an addend a special edition insert <laughs> um, so uh, at Barney's um, for many years we, our brand was defined as taste luxury humor and I always think a three-word brand defining thing it's good for a person an angora rabbit mm -hmm. a bookstore the strand funky dirty labyrinthine mm -hmm. right so three words that define your brand what are the three words that define your style in a broad sense i'm gonna go with two <laughs> messy and colorful messy and colorful it's, uh, there was a really there was a really funny review of the book from World of Interiors that came out like a couple days ago, which I was really excited about for any World of Interiors anything. And they said one of the things she said in the review was that there's when she was reading it, she felt like there was no place in the whole book where she could put down her cup of tea. And I just loved that. I was like, oh god, I feel so accomplished. There wasn't even a moment, you know, <laughs> and in like in, in the picture, meaning like she couldn't, you know, it's just You're so messy. You're a maximalist, right? Yeah. yeah, I like it. So, questions, audience, how are we doing for time? We've got time for a few audience questions. All right, you start screeching okay. when we're going over time. I'm going to have you use the microphone. Oh, do you have a next book planned? I do, of course. 
And will it be at the Strand? <laughs> will it be at the Strand? Of course. Yeah, all my books are at the Strand. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? You, you know, Strand actually has a book before I even had a book. In the rare books, Bill here saw it, and right? And it might, when, I, when I made one of my, like, home, I don't even know if I did that on my home printer or what that was in the rare books. I was so proud. <laughs> one in Paris when I first started out. They're like, yeah. Great. Anybody else? So when you when you started the book, um, I don't know how much of a fashion person you were, but by the end of the book, what had you learned? What ch what changed during the time that you did the book? Um, well, I yeah, I guess I've always kind of been around, floating around in the fashion world, but never really like I've always been an outsider, but kind of like involved a little bit, you know, more than the food world. I was like I was clueless, um, but with the fashion world, I guess the thing that really change was I knew how much work kind of it was but like it's just so epic you know people <laughs> just the amount of labor that goes in it's just like this never it's just this hamster wheel and it just goes so fast and goes fa it just accelerates and it's something that people don't you know I'm just like wow I really appreciate it and I appreciate the people but I'm like I could never really get into that wheel it would just I would go crazy I always tell young people that I say why do you want to be a fashion designer it's the most excruciating amount of work and pressure it's so difficult and um but you know i just crush their dreams <laughs> and tell them <laughs> the food book definitely did because i was so like uninformed about the food world and like basically clueless as to what happened in the back of restaurants or farms or anything that was going on. I just really didn't have a clue. I mean, the fashion world, I kind of knew. It just, I don't I don't think it really changed me as much as like, it, I, I learned a lot and just kind of, uh, I mean, one, one thing that it really impressed upon me was how important it is to be, when you have, whether, no matter what you're doing, is to be really directional and striking out on your own path. And whatever it is, it's like boil down whatever you do to its essence and go for that and it's to be everything for everyone is never going to work you know so people that I saw in the book that I was most excited about were like the ones that were so directional in their focus and um, and I think that they get the most response in that you know maybe it's people think oh you should do this because it'd be more popular you know it's like actually the best route that you can take is um, your own path and the weirder it is the better really any plans for your own ready to wear line Definitely not. No, I don't want to be on the hamster wheel, like I was saying, you know, it's like, forget it. Do you have any other questions out there this evening? Um, In the back. How long, oh. um, I was just wondering how long you spend with your subjects. Like, do you, do you go back multiple times, or is it just one shot that you... Uh, um, it kind of varies, like... I mean, like the LV, the LV project, we ended, we shot in the Paris Atelier, we shot in New York, we shot in Tokyo. That was like probably the most. Um, a lot of them are like a day because it's kind of like I want to see their process. I want if I can see them at home and see them at work. So it kind of varies, but generally, like the least half a day. If normally, it's kind of like somewhere a little bit more than that. Are you a workaholic? Are you somebody who wakes up super early in the morning, gets started, and doesn't finish till way late? What does your daily process kind of look like? It's kind of, I don't know, it's weird, because I'm kind of like a workaholic, but then it's kind of like I'm never working. <laughs> so it's kind I don't know. It's kind of a bit strange. Yeah. Um, Do you always wear your Tony Soprano blouson? I have different ones. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's fantastic. Thanks, Sam. Long live maximalism.